안녕하십니까. 삼성언론재단 상임이사 민명기입니다. 저희 삼성언론재단에 주관하고 한국기자협회 그리고 한국언론학회가 공동 주최하는 해외 강사 초청 행사에 참석해 주셔서 대단히 감사드립니다. 특히 오늘은 연말 행사도로 많이 바쁘실 텐데 여기 와주셔서 다시 한번 진심으로 감사 말씀드립니다. 어, 시작에 앞서서 두 분을 소개해 드리겠습니다. 먼저 전체 진행을 맡아주실 이와이즈 대학교 커뮤니케이션 미대학부의 박승희 교수님이십니다. 어, 콜롬비아 대학에서 사회학을 전공하셨고 퍼디 대학에서 언론학 박사를 하셨습니다. 기자로서도 오랫동안 활동을 하셨고 현재도 많은 칼럼을 기고하고 계십니다. 어, 그리고 오늘 주제 발표를 해주실 분은 제레미 케플린 교수입니다. 어, 뉴욕 시립대 교수로 계시고 프린스턴 대를 졸업하셨습니다. 그리고 콜롬비아 대학에서 MBA 및 저널리즘 석사 학위를 하였고요. 타임 및 뉴스위크 어, 기자를 역임했고 야후에서도 근무한 바 있습니다. 어, 현재는 뉴욕 시립대 뉴마크 저널리즘에서 어, 저널리즘 스쿨에서 디지털 저널리즘 그리고 기사 쓰기 그리고 저널리즘 창업 등을 가르치고 있습니다. 어, 그럼 제레미 케플린 교수의 강연을 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. It's a special pleasure and an honor to be here with you. This is my first time in Seoul, and I feel very privileged to, to be here. My, uh, my wife, actually, Karen, was here several years ago on a trip uh, for high school teachers and uh, has been teaching me a little bit about Korean culture. And we're both great admirers of, of Korean culture, and, and we're both continuing to learn more. And uh, we're sharing with our daughter, Rebecca, who's uh, enjoying some beautiful Korean arts. Uh, I want to thank the, the Samsung Press Foundation for the invitation to speak here and the opportunity to be here with you this evening. And thank you to the organizers for making this event possible. And thank you all for, for coming and joining us and sharing your time and attention with us on what I think is a very important topic. I want to take you back to a scene. A jazz band is playing for a very hip 20-something crowd in New York City, crowded bar. Two 23-year-old reporters are uh, talking over some, some drinks, Harry and Bratch. They're reminiscing about classes together at Yale University, and they're talking about how problematic the media has become. They say magazines are sensationalized, and newspapers, they say, are boring, even though they work for a newspaper. This is a true story, by the way. And Harry and Beth Bratch both agree that people are so busy, they don't have time to keep up with everything these days. And uh, Harry grew up in China, incidentally. Bratch grew up in, in uh, Brooklyn. Um, but they both feel that the news media is just overwhelming, regardless of where you're from. Um, and so they, they, they feel that the news, that what people need is something more concise, something more efficient. And uh, after a few beers and some drinks, they outline a new kind of aggregator. And they say it should have about 100 stories a week. No story should be more than 400 words. And a few days later, uh, Harry writes to, to, uh, to his girlfriend. He says, the two of us, he's talking about himself and his friend, the two of us are showing signs of pernicious insanity and will probably undertake a new publishing venture in a few months. He says, it's the gamble of our lives. Harry and Bratch start calling some of their friends, telling them about this gamble, trying to raise $100,000 for this new thing that they're going to create. And as you might have guessed, they had some trouble. People were very skeptical of a new media venture. They said, this is never going to work. This is a crazy notion. And what you might not guess unless you know this story, is that this pl takes place not now or any time recently, but back in 1921. And 
the Harry and Bratch that I'm speaking of were Henry Luce and Britton Haddon, who were about to publish the first issue of Time Magazine, which at the time was a very strange kind of new media venture. And the idea was, much like many of the new ventures today, to take an overwhelming amount of news and information and make it digestible, make it interesting, make it resonate with today's news consumers or the news consumers of that day. Fast forward about 85 years from that night in the bar in 2006 now, and these two are dead by this point. And another meeting is happening at the magazine that they founded. And the journalists and editors are thinking about very much the same kind of question, which is how can we address these consumers in this changing time when everyone's overwhelmed with news and information? What can we do? What can we create? And I remember that particular meeting in 2006 because I was there and we were trying to wrestle with what we were gonna do. And what we didn't know at that point was what was ahead of us in 2006. And we had no idea of all the things that didn't yet exist. The Samsung Galaxy, the iPhone, any smartphone, Facebook newsfeed, Facebook like button, Spotify, Twitter, Instagram, Line, Vine, TikTok, all of these things did not yet exist. We had no idea what was coming. Future is very unpredictable when it comes to technology and media change, and we had no idea of any of that. What we did know, what we did have a sense of, was that people would want to listen to things. We had a sense that people would want to watch things. We had a sense that audio and video were going to be part of what was happening. But the notion of journalism products and product innovation was still a long way away. So fast forward from that time in 2006 on to 2020, where we stand on the cusp of yet another shift, yet another set of new changes and technologies and challenges that we face. And as in that period, it's very hard to say what those new things will be, right? In 2006, again, remember, we had no idea about any of these things. And in 2020, we have no idea what kinds of things will replace these things. So we're looking at a lot of uncertainty. Anyone who claims to have certainty is probably missing things that we just can't know about. And what I'd like to make the case for tonight is that we are in the midst of the era of journalism innovation, of product innovation in journalism. And what I mean by that is new ways journalism organizations are gathering information, providing news to audiences, consumers, marketing what they do, and making money on what they do. It's really those four core things. For tonight, I'm focusing mainly on the, the question of new products and the creation of new products and services and new forms of journalism. And it's really the same challenge faced by Henry Luce and Britton Haddon a century ago, just in a slightly different context and a slightly updated time. And it's the same kind of challenge faced by news entrepreneurs in every era. The context is different, but the core challenge is the same. So I'd like to look at some specific examples of news innovation to give us a sense of how some people are doing this and how some solutions are working and about some of the challenges that we're facing. I'd like to start at the New York Times, partly because I think it's, it's a good organization that's doing good work, good quality traditional journalism, but in new ways. And partly because I know it well, I work next door to it in the, in the center of Manhattan in Times Square. In recent years, the New York Times has done a lot of soul searching about how it can survive and thrive. So it's not just about survival. It's not enough. We need to thrive, not just survive. And like many news organizations, the New York Times is facing declining advertising revenue and declining subscriptions. So they're not immune to the same challenges faced by news organizations here and in Europe and throughout the world. 
And they had to come up with a new way of addressing those challenges. And what I want to share with you is the journey that they made and how they managed to do that. They're still in the midst of the journey, but there's been quite a lot of progress and quite a lot of success in business terms and in journalism terms. So they did a lot more than create a flexible paywall. A flexible paywall was very innovative at the time, and that was very experimental and very risky, by the way. There were a lot of debates within the times about that. A lot of people disagreed with their decision to do so. But what I want to talk about is not the paywall, but actually the new products that they created. Because I think in the long run, the paywall is less significant than the product innovation. They focused on a few different areas, um, apps, events, newsletters, podcasts, and more. And I'm just going to highlight a few things, that uh, specific things that they did. They created a cooking app. So they took some of the properties of the New York Times that were very popular but weren't monetized. So they've always had recipes in the New York Times. They've always had games and crossword puzzles. They've often had great storytelling, but it hadn't been done in these formats, in these ways. So the cooking team, which by the way consists of an interdisciplinary group, and this is something I'd like to emphasize, is innovation in many different companies, but in journalism as well, needs to come from inter interdisciplinary, diverse teams. If you get a bunch of people who have all done the same thing in their experiences in the same realm, they're going to think in the same ways in many cases. If you get a diverse team that includes a reporter, a business person, a designer, a developer, you start to get some creative thinking about new kinds of products, new kinds of solutions. Technology companies, Innovative companies in retail and other areas have, have traditionally done this as well and found success with it. And in journalism, we're now starting to do that. So these are the five kinds of people that are on a typical New York, teams, New York Times product team. By the way, this is true now at the Washington Post and many other innovative news organizations as well. So the cooking team, for example, which created this product in the end, basically said, what can we do? What can we create with all this material we have in our archive and the recipes that we produce and the cooking coverage that we produce? And they basically took it as an experimental process. You know, I think product innovation in journalism is, has a lot in common with scientific experimentation. You have a hypothesis, you experiment, you iterate, and you create different versions of the product till you get it right. And so they created a variety of different versions, various different price points, various different target audiences and ended up with a product that now, as you see on this slide, um, generates 40% of the new digital subscriptions. So of the subscriptions that New York Times gets, 40% of them now, in the past year, have been either subscribe subscriptions to the cooking product or to the games product. So it's significant additional revenue, a significant increase in the number of subscribers through these approaches. And some people might say, well, this isn't in-depth investigative journalism that they're, that they're selling here. And I would say that's true. What they're doing is subsidizing the investigative accountability in-depth journalism with other kinds of products. And that's common, right? In the news industry, we've often, people have paid for sports, for example, or they've subscribed for sports information. And that's very, very profitable on TV news, for example. And that subsidizes in-depth international coverage, for example. When I worked at Time Magazine, we had an Iraq bureau where it was, it was a, really a cost center. It's very expensive to operate an international bureau in a war zone. But we were able to shoulder that additional cost because some of the other parts of the magazine were subsidizing, with entertainment coverage, et cetera. So they work together and form a, a set of products that are complementary. In the realm of, of cooking and games, there are now 850,000 new digital subscribers, so it's a significant number of people. Um, and they've also made an acquisition. They acquired something called Wirecutter to provide fair reviews, um, trusted reviews of products. And they generate revenue through that for, um, through e-commerce, so affiliate revenue. And the world of audio is the last piece I'll emphasize here. Um, there are now 770,000 podcasts in the international podcast database used by iTunes and other podcast players. And 10,000 new podcasts emerge every week. But a lot of those have very few listeners. What the Times did, which was very creative, was say, people don't need to know every story every single day. We're going to tell one story in depth each day and do a really quality, in-depth storytelling. 
And they succeeded above a lot of other podcasts which were just giving commodity information that everybody already knew. So that podcast now has hit a billion downloads, one billion downloads, and every day about two million people listen to it. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the, the monetization, basically the advertising within the podcasts is what makes money. And the, mon and the um, CPM rates, the advertising rates, are about 10 times what they are for typical print ads, traditional print ads, or digital ads, because you're listening to someone's voice and you're hearing that one ad and you're really listening to that ad. So it's generated more than, more than um, 10 million in revenue um, on, an, on a sort of annualized basis. So these are some examples of what the New York Times is doing successfully to generate new revenue, to create new products, and to serve audiences in new ways, consumers in new ways. They also have uh, a series of events. They have a wine club. They take readers on a tour of the world, uh, um, very expensive cruise. They have all kinds of new services and products to reach their readers in new ways and to make sure that they can sustain the organization and grow the organization. So a few things that they look for in terms of um, when they're creating new products, right? They need the products to have editorial value, and they need the products to have business value. They want the products to extend beyond New York City. They're focused on a potentially a global audience. 16% of the New York Times subscribers are now from outside of the US, about 500,000 people. And they're focused on products that people will use frequently. They want to develop habits, just like electronics companies. They want organic growth. They don't want to have to mark. They don't have to spend a lot of marketing dollars, um, and they want to do something that benefits the brand and uses the New York Times brand. These are a couple of the kind of product areas that are common across a lot of the new uh, media organizations and traditional media organizations that are thriving. There's many different kinds of products, but newsletters, podcasts, and data products are three of the most important ones in my view. One of the reasons I say that is because the propensity to subscribe for someone who downloads a podcast or signs up for a newsletter from a news organization is about double that of someone who has no connection to that publication. That's what the data shows. So in other words, if I'm a subscriber to a New York Times newsletter, I'm twice as likely to become a paid subscriber to the news organization, even if I'm getting the newsletter for free. Same thing with a podcast. So they're essentially like entry drugs, entry points, right, for a news organization. The New York Times and Washington Post both have more than 50, 5 zero, more than 50 different newsletters, all of which introduce new, new readers to their publications. They also have multiple podcasts. And increasingly, they're using data in innovative ways. By the way, this is an example of a kind of creative new newsletter approach, right? Newsletters can be very engaging. It can be very dynamic and well-designed. When the New York Times is launching a product, these are five questions they consider. Will customers pay for this? If not, what other revenue can we get from this? How is this unique? Can we acquire another product or service? Um, and how can we use New York Times content? Here's an example of something New York Times did recently. This is not a podcast. This is not a newsletter. This is a news story but it's a news story that adapts for you as a reader. So this is telling you how polluted your city is, air, air pollution. Um, you can see Dubai is significantly polluted. Um, the Bay Area, when the fires are happening, is very polluted. And you can see up here, New Delhi is dangerously polluted, right? You get a visual, and there's actually a, a nice augmented reality application. You can look, you can hold your phone up and see around the room what the pollution looks like in your city. So you, as a reader, if you're here in Seoul, you can open up this story or the app and see what's the rate for your particular city, right? It's a specifically designed for you, not just a generic article, right? Articles, in many cases, look the same to any reader, no matter who you are or where you are. But with new approaches to journalism, we can create customized, personalized stories that add value to you. Still gives you the same quality reporting and information, just adds an additional element that gives it additional value for you. Other organizations are also using data in creative ways. ProPublica is the leading investigative news organization in the United States. They're a nonprofit, and they actually have a data store. 
So they collect all kinds of data sets and they've actually found that a lot of businesses and companies will buy data from them. So it allows them to do really high quality work. It's a different kind of product. Texas Tribune is another um, successful new news organization and they create data that again can be customized and personalized for the user. This is an example of a, of a salary um, search engine essentially. So public salaries are uh, salaries are public of public people, people who work for the public in Texas. And uh, it turned out that the football coach is the most highly paid public official in Texas. So lots of news organizations are taking a strategy of creating niche products. Here's several examples of that. So in addition to creating products in different kinds of platforms like newsletters and podcasts and using data, they're creating new brands, new sub-brands. Right? If you think of food companies, food companies are always creating sub-brands. So news organizations are now creating special niche brands successfully. I'll just talk about a couple of these. The Boston Globe created STAT. That's my home city of Boston. It's a science city. Right? It's the university capital of the United States. More universities per capita in Boston than anywhere else in the United States. So they capitalized on that, and they created a product for professionals in the health and science arena. But those professionals don't just live in Boston. They live all over the United States and all over the world. So they created a high quality, high end subscription product focused on health and science. Uh, Atlantic created a product for international people in business, um, young people in business in particular. Um, the WBUR, which is a Boston radio station, collaborated with the New York Times to create a podcast about love stories based on a column the New York Times has called Modern Love which is now actually made into a, an Amazon Prime TV show with Anne Hathaway, Dev Patel, and various other actors. So that's a whole nother revenue stream for WBUR and for the New York Times is creating video. In fact, the New York Times has three video shows, two on Netflix and one on Amazon Prime. One's called Diagnosis, about science mysteries. Uh, another is actually um, from the daily, from the podcast, they created a weekly TV show. So another new revenue stream for them. I want to move on to another area of interesting innovation and, and experimentation. It, it's in the realm of interactivity. And when I was a boy growing up in Boston, I used to love classical music, basketball, and these books. They were called Choose Your Own Adventure. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. You'd say, on page 20, you'd say, if you want this character to build their own robot, robot turn to page 20. If they, if they decide to, uh, to run away and hide, turn to page 30, et cetera. You customize the story. I felt like I was helping create the story. And once I played along, I ended up with a story that belonged to me, right? It's interactive kind of storytelling. Um, last year, Netflix played with this con concept with a show called Bandersnatch. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's a choose your own adventure, right? You affect the direction of the story. And news organizations are now starting to experiment with this as well. So here's an example. This is uh, from a company called Echo, E-K-O. And they've worked with BuzzFeed and other news organizations to create interactive cooking videos and other genres as well. So you can see here, you choose right, what you want the recipe to be like. Right? So it's not just a generic piece of content. It's content that's personalized for you based on your choices. So you can choose the sauce, the protein, the spices, et cetera. And once you customize it, you can watch a customized video. You can um, see the ingredients and order, even order it online. They've uh, earned an investment from Walmart of $250 million, and they have five to 15 different patents. So they're taking a technological approach, but the core idea is to provide you with a custom experience. BuzzFeed, incidentally, has another kind of product. They're, they're using e-commerce. They're selling physical products. So they found that millions of people trust BuzzFeed and read BuzzFeed. So they actually sell various different kinds of products to that audience, and it's become a quite a profitable arena for them. The next example I want to talk about is in the sports realm. This is The Athletic. It's the biggest new sports brand in the US in terms of sports news. They charge $10 a month, and they have 600,000 subscribers already. They're moving into Europe now, and they have no advertising. They have a personalized app that focuses on the sports that are of interest to you. 
They have writers who are exclusively on that platform. And they make it an engaging kind of experience for sports coverage. They have more than 60 different podcasts. And the, the fact that they have zero ads is important. Um, at least in the US, um, there's a strong and growing dislike for advertising in the digital realm. People feel that ads are intrusive, that ads are tracking them. In a global survey, a global web index survey, 47% of internet users across the globe said they've used an ad blocker. So advertising is, is anathema to many people, many sports fans, many readers. And people like the fact that there are zero ads. So they've now more than 60 podcasts in addition to that. And they focus not just on scores or commodity information. They focus on investigative reporting, even in the realm of sports. So for example, they recently had a report which showed that the Houston Astros baseball team had spied on the uh, opposing team with hidden secret video cameras. So that's a, that's a trend globally as well, niche sports sites that are doing things in new ways. There's a German soccer site focused on a number of different individual teams, multiple sites. There's a, um, a site in the US that focuses just on hockey fights, right? Very, very narrow niche products for niche consumers, niche audiences. I wanna move to France for the next example. Um, in a world overwhelmingly filled with distractions, journalism needs to grab people by the shoulders, seize their attention, and hold on tight. One of the strongest new approaches in France comes from Le Jour, the days. The news organization picks obsessions or long-term important topics and creates serialized stories that unfold over a long period of time like TV episodes that have cliffhanger episodes that are so suspenseful you can't wait to find out what happens next. We take subjects, we grasp them, and we never let them go, says the president of Le Jour, Isabelle Robert. When they cover a story, they stick to it for months. We were there yesterday, we're there today, and we'll be there tomorrow, she says, even when other news media have moved on. A lot of news culture has become hit and run. They stay with the story over a long period of time. In fact, they've focused on 117 stories, 117 obsessions. And they cover a range of different kinds of topics. Um, one of them focused on a French media mogul, how he took over a major TV channel, has 134 episodes. By comparison, Game of Thrones had, uh, I think, 73 different episodes. So they really stick to a story over a long period of time and get in depth. One of the stories was about jihadists returning to France. It was turned into a best-selling book, and even a feature film was based on it. So additional revenue opportunities coming from in-depth coverage. Every story, by the way, Le Jour publishes, has a list of characters and even a song playlist. So you can listen to music that suits the story you're reading about. It's creative thinking about how to serve customers in creative new ways with quality journalism. The journalism is still quality work. Le Jour focuses on storytelling that delves into complex issues that people care about. Here's their equation. Relevant information plus powerful storytelling equals a recipe for compelling journalism. They've succeeded in holding people's attention. The site has no ads and charges nine euros per month. 95% of their subscribers renew. Most of the readers are under 35, so they're reaching new audiences. And readers actually can even invest in the company for as little as 200 euros. So far, they've acquired about 8% of the company. Um, they've also extended storytelling into the real world. They, they um, have published seven books, but they also have events at a local bar near their offices. So they're meeting the community and taking part in their audience connection. So this is another example of a book. I, I mentioned books. This is another example from Quartz in the US of making a book out of their journalism, which they're able to sell and add additional revenue. I want to move to India for, for the next example. Um, and this is a completely different kind of market. 
In remote regions in central India, which you see here depicted in this film, few newspapers exist, and local TV is virtually non-existent. CGNet Swara is an innovative news service that serves rural news consumers by collecting news reports through a central phone number that people can call or text. Local editors fact check, edit, and publish the submissions. People in the community can access the news in various different ways, mainly through their phones. Um, Devanch Mehta, who I spoke with recently um, when he was in New York, he said that about 35% of what they publish is about problems in the local area, like a broken water pump, for example. And they've collected, since they began a few years ago, they've collected 10 million phone numbers. And they're able to then follow up with people, ask them additional questions, gather additional information for them, and they've built a very strong network of, of contributors and readers. 610 million people in India have smartphones, uh, a number that's expected to double by 2024. But hundreds of millions do not have smartphones. They have much more limited phones. And that's why CMG has designed and implemented an entirely low-tech, low-data way to address the vast population of locals who don't read newspapers and don't have access to TV. So in different contexts, journalism innovators come up with very different kinds of solutions. So who are the people that create these products? I want to tell you about one of them named Erin Zlomek. She happens to work in New York City. She has an MBA. She's a reporter, but she's also a business person. She's a product manager. She's one of the, a new generation of people at the intersection of the editorial side and the business side. And I want to suggest to you that what we need in journalism, for journalism to thrive, is a new generation of leaders who work at the intersection of the editorial and business sides. I want to be clear that I don't mean to say that there's no division between what happens in the business side and what happens in the editorial side. But we need people who can see both and understand both and take into consideration ethical issues, as well as business issues and journalistic issues. Aaron's job title didn't exist 10 years ago. There were no product managers, as far as I know, in journalism a decade ago. Now it's the fastest growing job, at least in the US, in journalism circles. At Bloomberg, they have 2,700 reporters who push out about 5,000 stories every day and get syndicated to about 440 publications around the world. But they need new products. They need new areas of coverage. They need new systems to, to create innovation within the company. So Aaron's job and other product managers have essentially three jobs, three parts to their job. The first is to identify problems and opportunities, both in how information is gathered and how it's distributed to people. The second is to propose specific solutions and new kinds of products and services. And I'll give you an example of one in a second that she came up with. The third is to lead the development of these new products and services, to so actually create them, create a timeline, figure out what the product requirements are, and actually lead the development of these new products. Sometimes the new products are new areas of coverage, so a new professional service focused on a particular kind of commodity, for example. But sometimes it's a tool for the journalists themselves to do more efficient work. So Aaron's team, for example, came up with a new system for pooling all of the kind of PR information that journalists were getting and using artificial intelligence to figure out who needed which information when, basically more, more effectively and efficiently manage all the information flowing into the company. Um, having worked with a, a lot of news entrepreneurs from around the world, here are some lessons we've learned about this product management process. First is to start with a small objective. A lot of these products are really niche products, and they grow into something larger over time. Second is a lot of these products that are successful are tested with real users. The New York Times did numerous, numerous tests of that cooking product with, with small groups of people. The old way of doing product innovation within news organizations and elsewhere was to sit in an office for six months and write long business plans and do all kinds of abstract research which doesn't necessarily equate to what real people will do with real, real products. So what we need to do is not sit in an office for six months and research and plan. We can do that after we have some tests, if we need to. But we need to test with real users really early on. So it's a much more iterative process and, and much more design thinking kind of process. 
focusing on real customer needs based on real customer behavior and based on data we have about what customers are actually doing. So I want to bring us back to the, the era of, of, of Henry Luce and, and Harry Bratch for, for a few minutes before we, before we wrap up. And I want you to imagine they're standing back here in this lovely room in Seoul. They're standing in the back of the room. Maybe it's their ghosts of Henry Luce and Bratch Haddon. And I want you to try to imagine what their impressions might be of what's happening today in this moment in our, in our media history. Imagine them standing there stunned at all the devices we're using today. And think about what the world was like, right? It was a newspaper world. It was a world focused on newspapers, magazines, radio, word of mouth. That was basically how people got their information. Even TV news was a long way away. Now imagine them facing the facts the cold facts facing us in 2019. Newspapers are shrinking. In the US, we're down to 7,000 newspapers, having had about 9,000 9, uh, as recently as 2004. The number of newspaper newsroom employees has dropped by 47% from 2008 to 2018, from about 71,000 newspaper journalists to about 38,000. Between 2017 and 2018 alone, about a third of the biggest US news organizations had significant layoffs. Many magazines have completely ceased print publication. Linear TV is in many cases losing favor to digital services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, et cetera. And even news radio is yielding to podcasts. So it's a very challenging environment from a business context. It's a very disruptive era. And news organizations increasingly have to weave a paid path through popular social and hardware platforms and operating systems to reach customers. And I know here in South Korea, as, el as elsewhere, platforms like Naver and Daum uh, attract a significant amount of attention and user interest um, from people who might have otherwise looked to news organizations. So we're clearly in, an, in a point of disruption, and that's partly why there's an, an urgency to this case for product innovation. For consumers, there's a somewhat different story. I would say for consumers, in some ways, it's a golden age. You can access news on any subject from anywhere in the world in seconds, much of it for free, on a device that fits in your hand. For about 30 cents a day, you can listen to anything you want to, virtually any song on any device, whenever you want. For about the same price, you can watch virtually anything from anywhere in the world, virtually speaking. You can almost instantaneously download any ebook or audiobook in seconds for free from a very variety of libraries. And you no longer need the power of a professional publisher to have your voice heard. Virtually anyone can share text, video, audio with the world for free in seconds. And many people are doing so on YouTube and other platforms. That's led to a diversification of media voices, which is in some ways a good thing. We've seen the emergence of powerful movements like the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Fridays for Future movement for climate change. We've seen a lot of movements emerge because people's voices are liberated. But the challenge has become managing this cornucopia of information. So how do we manage to maintain focus when you've got a lifetime's worth of media anytime you want it, anywhere you want it, on whatever device you want? It's like trying to maintain a diet standing in front of a buffet of delicious food from around the world. So as a result of this these series of challenges, we need, this is, another, this is an, another visualization of this idea of trying to cope with all of the stuff that's coming at us. Um, so what we need is a way to address that from a media perspective. We need to help people overcome that um, and create new forms of, of, of products that address these needs. Some of them will fail. This is an example from Vice on HBO, this product failed. New York Times on Espanol, they were creating 10 stories a day in Spanish, that product also failed. So we will in inevitably have some product failures along with the successes that we have. Ultimately, when we look back, we will see this as the era of product innovation and new business models. The era from 1997 to 2007 was the period of digital awakening 
That was when those of us working in journalism realized we had to move from analog to digital. It was not a passing fad, but actually a permanent shift. In the early part of that period, innovation in journalism basically meant coming up with a lively new magazine story or a clever new column in a newspaper. We're not in that era anymore, though. For the period that followed, 2007 to 2017, saw the emergence of mobile and social journalism. Smartphones became ubiquitous, social platforms and tech giants became dominant intermediaries. But this new era is the, is the opportunity era for news organizations to distinguish themselves and create new products that justify our existence and our value. And one thing I think we have to avoid is what I call the shiny object syndrome. The idea of chasing sort of innovation hype. Every year a new journalism savior is heralded. We once believed that iPads would be the future of journalism, of magazines. Virtual reality would change how stories were told forever. We placed great hope in Facebook Live and instant articles from Facebook. Um, some people still think blockchain will yield major fountains of revenue, magically. These and other technologies may have an important role to play. I'm not dismissing the value or the utility of these tools and technologies, but they're not golden tickets. What makes more measurable impact and what will make more of a difference for journalism in the next decade are subtle steps that integrate quality journalism into people's everyday lives. I think of this as incremental innovation. It's innovation that's practical and subtle, not flashy, not sexy, not really made of too many buzzwords. South Africa's most innovative news publication is called The Daily Maverick, which has published numerous award-winning investigations and has thousands of dedicated fans. What I've learned is that innovation is not bells and whistles and tricks, says the associate editor. I think it's finding where audiences are and then telling them stories in interesting ways that make them think differently. So what's next for, for products? I think we have to focus on these kind of core questions. Is this new product we're dreaming up desirable? People want it? Is it feasible? Can we do it? Is it viable? Is there potential revenue here? And is it compatible with what else we do and with our ethical and moral values? We have to look ahead and see what the opportunities are in terms of meeting consumer behavior where it is and how people are living and, and who people are. There are a lot of customers we've never served or we've underserved because we've aimed at a majority population in many cases. There are new technologies that are interesting this is a volumetric display. Um, there are new kinds of approaches to telling stories. This is using messaging for interactive storytelling. But I think the, the big changes um, will come from in a few areas. One, one actually I think that'll be interesting is, is international, uh, international collaborations. I think translation will be a, a, a significant factor in, in the coming decade. We'll see tech advances in AI translation. Make it, it'll make it increasingly easier and faster and cheaper to deliver high quality, virtually instantaneous translations of any content. Um, and that will lead people to consume content from other countries. We've had artificial international barriers to some extent. YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, these kind of platforms have normalized the consumption of international media. We've grown accustomed to listening to music from across the world and watching international TV shows. Um, and YouTube videos. In New York, um, people love watching Korean films, for example, or films from, from around the world. This is one example. In uh, Estonia, Danish dramas are hits. Um, even as political boundaries harden, cultural boundaries are beginning to wither, and I think that will impact journalism. I think we'll see products from one country increasingly cross over into other countries, particularly where there's an area of expertise. So a German soccer site might do very well in parts of Asia or in parts of Africa um, once you set aside the language challenge. Um, and I think we'll see growing use of AI, artificial intelligence, um, which, which I'm, I'm going to um, 
not to say too much about right now, but, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a hugely growing opportunity for journalists to take advantage of. Um, I think we need a new generation of journalists, as I said earlier, who have a new generation of skills. I think these are some of the core skills and core areas that journalists need to focus on in the coming years. I think not everyone can do everything, but we need specialists in each of these areas. And I think journalists will increasingly need to figure out where they can add to the organization that they're a part of. Product innovation is a core area, coming up with creative products, identifying opportunities, engaging with the communities we serve in new ways, being able to sell and persuade our colleagues of the importance of new opportunities, having subject expertise in particular areas is hugely valuable, being able to take initiative and create new things, and having self-awareness to know what our strengths and limitations are as a news organization and as individuals is, is significant. We still face challenges. In Korea, for example, the Reuters Digital News Report points out that only 10% of people here say they pay for online news. So we have consumer behavior that's not accustomed to paying for quality news at this point. I think some of that will change over time. We've seen, if you look at international rates, we've seen them grow to some extent over time. So I think that is a, is a trajectory that will change in a positive way. But I think it's still a challenge. And I think the way we need to respond to that challenge is by creating new kinds of products and services that meet people where they are, that address the needs that people actually have. And we have to be creative about finding revenue streams that fit that. So I'm actually optimistic. Um, I think it's not going to be all about cats and Kardashians. I think that we will find new ways of engaging consumers in creative ways because I've seen so many products do that so creatively. Here's one more example. Um, this is a, a project called The Listening Post. And what they do here is essentially post the phone number and let people get in touch um, to, to, to uh, connect with the news organization. What they found in this case was that locals, many locals reported spending 40 to 60% of their income on rent in this particular area of New Orleans. A story they didn't really know about or appreciate until they did this audience engagement effort, community engagement. And I think it's, it's emblematic of how news organizations need to reach out to communities and connect with those people that we are serving. The nature of news, era, news organizations changes in each era. Um, we've already start, started to see a movement towards some consolidation and co-publishing. Um, people sharing printing presses, for example. I think that will continue. I think we're going to have bigger players, big players getting bigger, but we're also going to have a flourishing of small niche news organizations. I think the biggest challenges ahead lie for those middle tier organizations that aren't quite big enough to compete aggressively with the larger players, but aren't nimble or narrow enough to stand apart from the smaller players. And we've seen US news organizations closing in significant numbers when they fall into that middle realm, that dangerous middle realm. I think in terms of quality news, we're going to see the need for civic engagement from a number of different civic, civic entities. So I think quality investigative journalism, accountability journalism is a public good just like clean water, clean air, safe roads, the market doesn't always pay for all of those things. We need civic institutions and various other kinds of support for some of that. So I think we'll see universities, philanthropists, nonprofit organizations playing a part in the journalism ecosystem. I don't think that will be the entire ecosystem, but I think that will be part of it. And we've seen that in the United States with a flourishing of 200 organizations that are part of the investigative nonprofit news network. So many of these organizations are generating philanthropic support, just like orchestras do, just like dance companies do, just like museums do, because they're doing quality work that is at the, at the core of our democracies, our cultures, our societies. And in some cases, that can be commercially viable. But in other cases, we need some philanthropic and other kinds of civic support. There are a couple things I think we need to do to, to conclude as far as news organizations. I think we need to listen carefully to our audiences and listen to what the data tells us about which articles people are reading, which articles they're completing, 
which articles are they most likely to subscribe when they're reading? We need to move past what we call vanity metrics, unique visitors and page views, and focus on engagement metrics. How connected are people with the organization, with the articles, with the content they're reading? I think we need to create new products that are compelling for people. Um, and we need to invest in products that are serving underserved audiences. Um, so we need to create products that aren't just for the generic customer, but for our particular sub-segments of the customer. We used to think of journalism as something we'd throw over a wall. Journalists would toss stories over the wall, and if readers found something of interest, so be it. If not, that was fine. Now, increasingly, we need to think of what we're doing as a service we provide as part of a vibrant ecosystem in a communal society. And that means that we stick to the eternal verities, quality reporting, watchdog reporting, ho holding the powerful to account, but we also create new products that people actually like and use, and we find creative ways to monetize those products. We should publish things in ways that resonate with people. Sometimes that means creating searchable data tables, newsletters, or podcasts. Other times it might mean an interactive article. We have to be creative and innovative. The recent developments I've talked about tonight are, I think, examples of how we're moving on a positive path in terms of being able to create new kinds of products um, that focus on real customer needs. These are examples of how it can be done. Back when we had near monopolistic or olig olig oligopolistic leadership of news distribution, it was much easier. Um, but we have a com more competitive, more disruptive era, and we have to meet that challenge. If we were uh, here today joined by Britton Haddon and Henry Luce, my guess is they would be creating new products to serve new audiences today. Um, they would focus on an underserved community or news area and address it with a lively new product. Maybe it would be a, a weekly newspaper aimed at young working urban professional women, which is a growing group around the world that may not be served adequately by existing business publications. Or maybe they would create a subscription daily newsletter service focusing on some specific sub-area of business or politics. With the changing tastes of customers, there are significant challenges, but there are so many new opportunities as well. I think it's an exciting and challenging era to be a journalist and to be working in a news organization, and I think it's, it's, it's an exciting moment because we can create what's next. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Uh, it's a true honor and privilege, as I said, and I look forward to continuing the, the conversation. Thank you. Hello, thank you. 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 Thank 커피 산지는 이디오피아죠. 그래서 이디오피아에서 난 커피가 장거리 무역을 통해서 터키를 통해서 어, 유럽으로 들어오고 그게 다시 영국으로 이제 들어온 후에 17, 8세기 영국에는 커피하우스라는 것이 굉장히 성업을 하게 됩니다. 근데 커피하우스는 큰 건물에 이제 1층에 주로 자리를 하면서 아무나 들어올 수 있는 오픈된 그런 장소였다고 합니다. 계층에 관계없이 누구나 평등하게 들어올 수 있는 거기 들어가면 어, 뭐, 돈이 되는 각종 정보, 선박 정보, 무역 정보들도 있고, 그 사회를, 에, 사회에 돌아다니는 각종 뉴스와 루머들도 거기서 수집을 할 수가 있었고, 교환이 가능했습니다. 또, 음, 배운, 많 배운 분들, 돈을 많이 번, 버신 분들은 또, 정치적인 토론의 장으로서 많이 활용을 했다고 합니다. 근데 거기서 이제 이름이 커피하우스니까, 이국적인 음료인 커피를 마시면서, 커피만 마신 것이 아니라 술도 마시면서 아주 막자지껄하게 많은 토론이 장이 이루어졌다고 합니다. 어, 이제 제가 오늘 그좀 장황하게 이런 말씀을 드리는 이유는 오늘 카플란 교수님 강의를 발표를 들으면서 아, 저널리즘과 술집이 이렇게 밀접한 관계라는 것을 제가 다시 한번 확인했다는 것입니다. <웃음> 그 저는 그 100년 전에 우리가 잘 아는 타임지가 뉴욕의 한 바에서 잉태됐는지를 이번 기회에 처음 알았어요. 그리고 아까 말씀하신 그 프랑스의 사례도 파리의 바에서 시작이 됐다고 말씀하셨거든요. 자, 근데 이제 그 100년 전 이야기로 시작은 하셨지만 오늘 주제는 사실 저널리즘 분야에서 가장 미래지향적인 그런 주제가 아닐까 생각합니다. 
저널리즘과 벤처와의 만남인데요. 그러니까 벤처 하면 우리가 실리콘밸리에 있어야 될 것으로 생각이 되는데 그 벤처가 어떻게 저널리즘과 만나서 서로 화합하고 서로 어, 그, 그 어떤 시너지를 낼수 있는지 그런 부분에 대해서 어, 너무 재밌는 흥미로운 말씀을 많이 해주셨고 또 좋은 말씀을 많이 나눌 수 있을 것 같아서 기대가 되고 있습니다. 그래서 저널리즘의 미래 비전을 오늘 우리에게 제시해 주신 카플란 교수님을 좀 길었지만 인트로덕션이 <웃음> 다시 한번 박수로 맞아 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Thank you very much for your wonderful speech, a wonderful presentation with nice slides and um, with your um, forecasting a ray of sunshine upon a much troubled you know, journalism industry nowadays with your, I would say, uh, evidence-based optimism. I'm very looking forward to our talk tonight. And, <laughs> and I think, uh, I believe, my, my, I, the audience will feel the same way as well. Um, so, the entrepreneurial journalism is kind of new to us. So could you start by explaining what that constitutes? Sure. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit of a made-up word that we created to basically explain that we wanted to do something different, disruptive. Journalism has to change, just like every field has to change. And entrepreneurial journalism is about gathering information and distributing it in creative new ways and monetizing it, making money on it in new ways, sustaining our industry in new ways. The industry cannot remain the same as economic forces and technological forces and social and political forces change. We have to change rapidly. There's an urgency to the change. And so we are trying to, to help nudge the industry along and help think about how the industry can succeed by developing this new field of entrepreneurial journalism. So that the journalism could survive and thrive, right? Exactly. Exactly. 어, 지금 간단하게 설명을 해주셨는데요. 사실은 그 혁신 저널리즘을 아주 선도하고 계시는 개척자라고 저는 소개를 해드리고 싶습니다. 어, 저 지금 저널리즘 디그리와 MBA 디그리를 동시에 가지고 계시거든요. 그래서 그 둘의 그 흔치 않은 조합이에요. 그래서 저는 이제 그래서 여쭤보고 싶은 게그 둘의 조합에서 어떤 가능성을 찾게 되신 어떤 계기가 있으신지 그게 궁금합니다. So, I mean, first of all, there's two parts to it. One is, I think journalists need to have expertise to provide valuable information to readers. And that expertise could be that you have deep knowledge of the ancient history of a particular area, or you have engineering experience or military experience or something else you can bring to readers that's unique in that area of expertise. And for me, I wanted to be able to write about business as a journalist, and so I wanted to, to learn about business in order to write about it and report about it and to ask questions of people running businesses more effectively. So part of it, part of the MBA is just about being a more, um, being able to ask good questions as a journalist and understand business issues. The other part of it is there's no doubt that we're in a dramatically disrupted industry. Our industry is changing dramatically. And journalists, reporters, editors, photographers, videographers, we can't just sit along quietly and enjoy the ride, or else we'll ride our industry into oblivion. We have to take an active role in thinking about where the industry is heading and how we can make a positive contribution. So for, particularly for those of you who are the younger folks, the students, et cetera, the future journalists, future leaders in the, in the, in the hall tonight, I think it's incumbent upon you to help lead the industry in new directions. And you don't necessarily need an MBA to do that. I think you just need a mindset that says, okay, we have to change. We have to try some new things. And this is a crucial part. We have to think about which audiences, which parts of our community have we not adequately served? So who, whose voices have we not heard? Whose stories have we not told? Which products have we not yet created that people would actually find really valuable? Thank you. Kaplan 교수님께서는 되게 저널리즘 스쿨을 졸업하고 기자가 되는 사람이 많은데 그 전에 대학을 졸업하시고 기자로 한 10년? 10 years? Did you work as a journalist? Uh, 일을 하시고 그다음 미드커리어 저널리스트로 저널리즘 스쿨에 들어가셨어요. 그래서 아마 현장에서 취재를 하시면서 
느꼈던 어떤 한계나 아니면 이 인더스트리가 어떻게 발전할까에 대한 그런 문제 의식 같은 게 현장에서 취재를 하면서 더 많이 생기신 게 아닌가 그래서 그 듀얼 디그리를 하신 게 아닌가 저는 그런 생각을 했습니다. Yeah, so when I was working at Time Magazine, we often were um, trying to think about new products, but it was it was a very small group of us, and we're facing a very kind of traditional organization, very hierarchical organization, very slow to adopt new experiments and new change. And I think that's why we've seen many news organizations fail to adapt quickly enough. They don't have enough people who are empowered to try new things, to experiment with new things. In many cases, many of the organizations are still very hierarchical, very traditional, very slow to experiment. They're afraid to release products that might not be perfect. And I think one of the things, to go back to the New York Times, one of the things I think the New York Times has done right is they've failed multiple times. There was a New York Today app that they created. It was the first big mobile app. It failed. They created a VR application that they sent out a million cardboard headsets. You know, remember the cardboard, Google Cardboard? It was a big failure. New York Times Espanol, they failed again. After three years, they just closed it a couple months ago. So they've been willing to fail because out of those failures, they've built successes. And I think that's a new thing. Historically, they wouldn't have created those products. But they've had a change of, of mindset. They have a change of culture. And now they're creating things that are working. 그 제가 그 엔터프로니얼 저널리즘에 대해서 좀 알아보려고 이제 구글에 찾아봤는데 처음에 이 과목을 가르치실 때는 텍스트북도 없고 실러버스도 없었는데 그거를 처음부터 개발을 하시면서 만들어 놓으셨고 그 다음에 이 과목을 가, 뿐만 아니라 가르치고 싶은 사람들을 위해서 소위 티칭 툴이라고 하죠. 실러버스, 뭐 텍스트북, 참고서, 각종 자료 이런 것들을 전부 온라인에다가 올려서 쉐어를 해 놓으셨어요. 그래서 그동안 이제 당신이 쌓아온 노하우와 또이 분야를 추구하면서 얻은 각종 지혜와 지식을 아, 낭비없이 이렇게 사회와 어, 쉐어하려고 하시는 그런 분이구나 아주 좋은 인상을 저는 받았습니다. 그래서 오늘 발표하신 내용 중에 아주 흥미로운 사례들이 많이 있어서 재밌게 잘 들었습니다. 근데 아무래도 어, 그 이게 니즈 베이스로 하다 보니까 제 인상으로는 좀 너무 소프트 뉴스 위주로 이게 이노베이션이 진행된 건 아닌가 하는 생각이 들어서 특히 그 뉴스라는 표현을 대, 대신하는 프로덕트라는 표현이 계속 나, 나옵니다. 그리고 기자를 프로덕트 매니저라는 새로운 직업군으로 지금 자리매김을 하고 있다. 그리고 아주 fastest growing job이다 이렇게 말씀을 하셨습니다. 근데 제가 궁금증이 드는 것이 어, 여러분들도 마찬가지일지 모르겠지만 이게 뉴스를 프로덕트로 보기 시작하면 그 뉴스 안에 내재되어 있는 어떤 공공성이 좀 희미해지지 않을까 하는 우려가 있고요. 또 기자가 가지고 있는 사회적인 책임감 그런 것들은 이 혁신 저널리즘에서 어떤 위치를 차지하고 있을지 또 어떻게 조화를 이루어 나가고 있는지 그런 부분에 대한 어, 이야기를 좀 짚고 넘어가면 좋을 것 같다는 생각을 했습니다. So I think we we as journalists have have multiple responsibilities, right? We have responsibilities to society to to cover what's happening, to hold the powerful to account. to give voice to those people who don't have a voice in society. We also have a responsibility to our organizations to make sure we survive, right? We can't do great journalism if we don't exist. So we need to have both. We need to do quality work and we also need to have a business focus. And I think one thing that can happen is you create products that are great journalism and also are good for, from a business perspective. So the New York Times, to go back to that organization again, they, they have a, um, a product which is uh, a new series of coverage about the history of slavery in the United States. It's very serious, very in-depth coverage of a, of, a, of a history that hasn't been fully explored adequately in the United States. And they created a podcast out of that. There's a special publication. There's going to be a series of books that emerge from that. It's quality journalism, but it's also actually going to be a, a good business story for them as well. Um, in the case of the Washington Post, they created a new um, content management system called ARC, which they're now licensing to other news organizations. And that's a very profitable line of business for them, and it allows them to do quality journalism. So I think you can have, in a way, you can have your cake and eat it too. 
in the sense of creating products that are really good journalism but also are profitable. And I also think it's okay to create some products that are entertaining or interesting or engaging if those bring in money for the organization because then the organization can survive and hire new people and can do quality journalism. So it's okay, I think, to have what we call cross-subsidy. 혁신 저널리즘의 내용을 보면은 저널리즘 콘텐츠를 최대한 친절하게 그 독자 친화적으로 혹은 시청자 친화적으로 만들어서 사회와 소통하고 그들이 참여하게 하는 그런 어떤 그, 그, 그 외연을 확장하는 부분하고 굉장히 그 연관이 깊다고 생각하는 제가 두 가지 질문이 있습니다. 그 외연 확장과 관련해서는 two questions. <웃음> First one, 뉴스가 그러면 어디까지 확장이 될수 있는지. Where do you draw the line between the news and the ads and the PR messages and the documentaries and you know and so and so forth? 그 뉴스를 어디까지를 볼수 있는지 이런 부분이 있고요. 그 다음에 이제 두 번째는 제가 이제 좀 같은 질문이지만 좀 다르게 하는 것인데 아무리 확장을 해도 그래도 누군가는 이것이 뉴스다라는 것을 정하고. 그 가치를 판단하고 또 누군가는 그걸 글로 쓰는 사람이 있을 것이다. 그러니까 전통적인 저널리즘 프랙티스는 core practice of journalism은 그대로 있지 않을까. 그거는 그대로 있으면서 외연 확장과 어떤 새로운 만남의 방식에 치중하는 건 아닐까 그런 생각을 하게 됐습니다. 그래서 그거에 대한 의견을 좀 여쭙고 싶습니다. So in terms of the question about how do we where's the line between journalism and PR or branded content or something. I think many of the people in the room are distinguished journalists and you have a long tradition of distinguishing between PR and quality journalism. And I think that remains a challenge we have to continue pursuing. So we're in different formats. We're talking about podcasts or we're talking about social content on social platforms or we're talking about newsletters, et cetera. We're talking about new forms of distribution but the core journalism and ethical questions still remain the same. Is this journalistically sound? Are we doing this for editorial reasons? Are we doing this for business reasons? If we're doing it for business reasons, does it still make editorial sense? Is it still fair to our readers? So I think those questions are still ethical questions and principle questions that we still need quality journalism editors to adjudicate. And I think the 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 technology changes the nature of those questions a little bit, but the core challenge is the same. I remember working at a magazine a number of years ago and having debates about whether we could cover certain things because we had an advertiser who was interested in those topics. And those of us who cared about the, the journalism said, well, we have to stand by our journalism and do what's right for the reader, because ultimately we serve the, the reader, not the advertiser in this case. Um, so I think those, those things remain the same. They're just different technologies and platforms that we're dealing with. 그 혁신의 중심에는 저널리즘이 있다는 이야기입니다. 말씀을 들어보면 그리고 어, 그 작년에 그 구글에서 우리 저 이민규 회장님이 구글 뉴스 이니셔티브라는 그런 어, 팀의 무슨 특강이 있어가지고 제가 한 적이 있는데 거기서도 구글 뉴스를 가지고 혁신을 하려는 노력을 많이 하는데 누가 하느냐 이렇게 물어보니까 저널리스트들이 한다는 거예요. 시리어스 저널리스트들이. 다른 사람이 무슨 비즈니스 사이드에서 와서 하는 게 아니라 저널리스트의 경험이 있고 저널리즘의 솔리드 백그라운드가 있는 분들이 그것을 어떻게 좀더 낫게 할까 하는 그런 식의 혁신을 한다. 그러니까 저널리스트로서의 그 핵심 밸류 이런 것들은 그냥 가지고 간다. 이런 말씀으로 제가 이해를 했습니다. 이제 그 다음에 어 가장 또 여러분들이 좀 궁금해하실 질문 중에 하나가 지금 많은 사례를 말씀을 하셨는데 그 벤처는 어 사실 거의 실패합니다. 그렇죠? 그 중에 몇만 성공 성공하고 그런 물론 실패 경험이 쌓여서 나중에 성공은 하겠지만 어 지금 다양한 사례들을 우리에게 이렇게 제시를 해 주셨고 정말 흥미로운 것들도 많은데 궁금한 건 저게 얼마나 지속 가능성이 있는가 하는 것이거든요. 그래서 실제 지속 가능한 사례가 있는지 뭐 현재까지 지속되고 또 그런 지속 가능하게 하게 하는 어떤 요건이나 이런 것들을 발견하신 거는 있는지 그런 게좀 도움이 될것 같습니다. 이런 저널리즘 벤처를 시작하시는 분들에게는 그 서스테이너빌리티 
So uh, there's different kinds of organizations that we could talk about. We can talk about the very large international kind of giant organizations, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the BBC, et cetera. And then we can talk about the sort of local newspapers like the Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, whatever city you might be interested in. And then we can talk about smaller individual startups at the very, very local level or very niche topics. So in each case, there's different examples. And in each, cases, there's, each case, there's different challenges. What we can say is from the major news organizations like the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they've really turned a corner. So there was a period where they were taking major international loans. There was unclear whether they were really going to survive in the long run to a point where they're growing. They're actually hiring a lot of people. The Washington Post recently hired 50 new people. The Wall Street Journal just a couple months ago posted 25 new job openings. Um, the New York Times has hired a lot of people as well in, in recent times. So there's a lot of hiring. That's typically an indication that there's growth. Um, the revenue um, for the New York Times is public and that's been growing. Um, th it's been moving away from advertising and more towards subscription revenue and other product lines. Um, but the, the signs are positive for those big organizations. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's limited to a kind of a 1% tier, though, of the news ecosystem. Because there's still many, many other news organizations that are suffering and struggling. And part of that is because they don't have the bandwidth. They don't have the technology expertise. They don't have the people in these different areas that I mentioned earlier. They don't have product managers. They don't have negotiating power and negotiating with Facebook and Google and other platforms. So they're in a difficult position. And they are, in many cases, really struggling. Um, but there also are exceptions. You come in, right, to yeah. teach them how to succeed. We try. I mean, we, we don't have the answers, right? We, we, we just have the questions. The questions are what's important. And the experiments are what's important. We, we, there's no way that anyone coming in to the outside, from the outside can say this is what you need to do. Right? If anyone says that, they probably don't know your organization well enough. What we can do is say, have you asked this question? Have you looked at this data? Have you talked to these people who are actually using the product? Or those people who are not using your product? And why aren't they using your product? Right? So those are the kinds of questions we can expose people to or nudge them to, to think about. And sometimes we can nudge people to take an idea that they've been pondering and just bring it out, right? just actually do it, just, just run that experiment. And sometimes that leads to some interesting new intelligence for the organization. 아까 그 플랫폼 사업자 말씀을 하셨습니다. 그리고 우리나라에서도 어, 뉴스 애그리게이터라고 하는 네이버 같은 그런 커다란 포탈 회사가 뉴스를 디스트리뷰트하는 이런 현상이 어, 굉장히 좀 어, 심각한 문제이죠. 뉴스의 어떤 그 수익을 창출한다는 차원에서 근데 아직도 해결이 안 되고 있습니다. 많은 사람이 뭐 다양한 아이디어를 내고 있는데 우리나라에서도 이게 이제 뭐 법. 제화도 안 되고 있으면서 하여튼 해결이 안 되고 있습니다. 혹시 그런 문제와 관련해서 어, 좀 성공한 사례라든지 뉴스 레버뉴를 좀 그런 쪽에서 해결한 그런 사례가 있는지 궁금합니다. I think I think the key is to create something that can't be aggregated. So if you have a wonderful podcast that tells a story, I'll give you an example. There's a, a podcast called Last Scene um, from WBUR in Boston. It's a great podcast about the biggest art theft in American history. So in the middle of the night, one night when I was a kid in Boston, thieves snuck into the Gardner Museum, which is a beautiful old art museum, and stole some of the most precious art that existed in the United States. 30 years later, no one has any idea what happened, who did it, where the art is. These are precious works of art that have never been found. They're hidden somewhere. No one knows where. They told a dramatic podcast story over a number of episodes about that in, co in collaboration with the Boston Globe and the radio station. Millions of people listened to this, were fascinated by the story. No aggregator can take that. They can summarize what, something about it, but no aggregator can take the storytelling. And, and so that's a product that, that is unique for that organization. And many news organizations have really unique voices, columnists, people who have opinions, people who have expertise, analysis, that cannot be that cannot be aggregated. So we need products that are distinct and unique. If we create commodity products, if we're just offering commodity news about something that happened yesterday, or the weather, or a sports score, or a business transaction, if we're creating commodity news, we should expect to be aggregated, because that's just commodity information. What we should create instead is something unique, something valuable, something useful for people. 
should have never been part of the aggregator, right? We, uh, you should avoid. Well, I think if the aggregator gets us new voices, new exposure, so if new people come in to our funnel, we use the term the funnel, right? You need, you need a million people, right, coming in that are new to the organization if you want to end up with 10,000 customers, right? Because 10% of those million people will view a little bit more, 100,000, right? And then 10% of those will actually end up transacting in some way, right? So what that means is you need new people coming in, and sometimes they come in through an aggregator. And they say, oh, I've never heard of this publication. I've never tried it. What else do they have, right? And then they find something interesting that you do that no one else does. You have a great column. You have a great subject. You have a great investigative reporting. You have a wonderful podcast. You have a great newsletter. You have a cool AR application. Whatever you do that's unique to you that you can do really well, that is what's going to, in the long run, add value. And the, and the aggregator can be useful as a, as a, as a tool, right? Use the, use the aggregator as a tool to introduce new audiences. 알겠습니다. 처음부터 이용을 잘못했네요, 우리가. 네. 그, 그 벤처, 아, 저, 저도 하고 싶은 질문이 많은데, <웃음> 아, 제가 요, 이 질문을 마지막으로 해서 제가 그 마이크를 오디언스에게 넘기겠습니다. 자, 미래 저널리스트가, 아, 그러면은 앞으로 어떤 마인드셋을 갖고 어떤 기술을 개발하면서 이 새로운 환경에 적응해야 될지 그 질문을 제가 마지막으로 드리겠습니다. A learning mindset, a flexible mindset, the assumption that there's a lot that we do not know about a lot of things, about our customers. What time of day do they read our publication? Where are they? What device are they using? How long are they reading? Are they listening to other things? Are they watching other things? What are they doing when they get home from work? What are they doing on their way to work? We have to understand why they're looking for information. How does the information fit into their lives? What kind of stories do they love reading or listening to or watching? Who do they share information with? Why do they share information? We need to know as much as we can to understand the customers, and then we can provide them something that fits into their lives. If we um, also are working in a technological realm, right, where we're dealing with social platforms, we have to understand how those platforms work, what are the incentives that they have, how can we take best advantage of each and every platform to do its own thing. The Washington Post is experimenting on TikTok this year. The Washington Post is experimenting on Twitch this year, which is live video stream and commenting. They don't know exactly what it's for, and some of it hasn't worked. That's fine. They're learning about the platform and seeing what might be useful to them. So we have to have that learning mindset, that questioning mindset, that wondering mindset, and that willingness to, to run experiments. I think we also have to have a cross-specialty um, kind of collaboration that we do more of in, in news organizations. So we have to bring in people with different viewpoints, people maybe who weren't journalists, people who have expertise in architecture or law or business or science, particularly fields like science, where ex core expertise is so important. We have to bring in outside voices more often, get them to help us question what we do. Why do we run our science coverage this way? What could we do differently? So I think that's the kind of mindset we have. We need, we need a mindset that questions a lot of what we do. Journalism in 2020, if you pick up a newspaper in many places, looks a lot like the newspaper you would have seen in 1975 or in 1950. And I'm not sure that's the right thing, right? In some cases, we should be doing things quite differently, and, and we're doing them because we've been doing them. If we have a reason for doing them, that's one thing. <laughs> But if we're doing them just because we've always written articles of that length, that's not a good enough reason. We should be intentional about making choices and choose things that resonate with the consumers that we're dealing with today. 감사합니다. 다른 생각을 하는 열린 마음을 가진 그런 저널리스트가 필요하다고 합니다. 질문이 많으시죠? 질문하실 게 그래서 어 이제 질문을 받도록 하겠는데요. 되도록이면 많은 질 많은 분들에게 질문의 찬스가 돌아가게 하기 위해서 어 일단은 한 분당 질문 하나만 받는 걸로 하겠고 또 돌아가면서 또 다른 뭐 기회가 되면 또 받더라도 일단은 한 가지 질문만 해 주시고요. 또 이제 손을 드시고 어 일어나셔서 자기 소개를 해 주시고 질문을 해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 그럼 지금부터 어 질문을 받도록 하겠습니다. 아, 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 CBS 기자 김연지라고 합니다. 오늘 강의 너무 재밌게 잘 들었고요. 어, 일단 뉴스 상품을 어쨌든간 없던 걸 새로 없던 것을 이제 새롭게 시도를 해보기 위해서는 
일단 뭐 인력도 필요하고 제작 지원도 필요하고 여러 가지 비용이나 이런 게 필요한 하잖아요. 그러면 아무래도 이런 기자들이나 다른 그런 프로덕트 매니저들이 실제로 이렇게 하는 동안 어느 정도 회사는 수익을 기대할 수밖에 없는데 만약에 이게 어느 정도 수익이 나지 않을 수 있잖아요. 그럼 그럴 때 그럼 이제 경영 쪽에서 너네 이제 그만해 라고 했을 때 우리들은 당연히 더 시간을 주십시오 라고 얘기를 해야 되는데 그럼 얼마나 더 이런 새로운 모델을 시험할 수 있는 그런 기간이 얼마라고 생각을 하시는지 궁금하고 한 가지 더 있는데 하면 안 되겠죠? 성, 성김이 하나만 더 해도 될까요? <웃음> 죄송합니다. 그리고 아까 그 유료화 문제 유료화에서도 에 대해서도 언급을 해주셨는데 언론사들이 이렇게 과감히 시도를 하지 못한 이유가 한, 저는 두 가지 있다고 생각을 합니다. 첫 번째는 아무래도 우리는 유료화를 했는데 많은 다른 언론사들은 무료 무료로 제공을 하니까 그럼 우리한테 그 동안 오던 그 구독자들도 떨어지는 거 아니냐 여기에 대한 첫 번째 질문이 있고 이제 두 번째는 어, 언론의 공공성을 또 아무래도 이제 생각하지 않을 수가 없는 것 같아요. 이 양질의 콘텐츠도 누구나에게 언론 이제 기자라면 제공을 해야 되는데 만약에 이제 구독을 하지 않으면 그거를 어떤 사람들은 받지 못하니까요. 거기에 대해서는 어떻게 생각하시는지 궁금합니다. 죄송합니다. 질문하고 죄송하다고 이렇게 말씀하시네요. Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, very thoughtful questions. On the first one about time, I totally agree. These things take time to unfold. I think what we need to set are benchmarks along the way for progress. So if you are the New York Times, I'll give you an example. The New York Times is creating a new product area around parenting. I don't know how many people in the room are parents, but if I'm a, I'm a parent, relatively new parent, and I'm always interested in learning more about parenting. So it's an area that speaks to me. And what they're trying to figure out is what are the right formats of the product? Is it they already have a newsletter? Should they have podcasts? Should they have books? Should they have some TV product? Should they have some sort of interactive content? What should the pricing be? There's a lot of questions they don't know they, they don't know the answers to yet, but they're experimenting, and that experiment will not be done in three months. It will not be done in six months. It may not even be done within a year, but within a year they'll have some traction. So they'll have a hundred thousand subscribers to the newsletter. Or they'll have a hundred thousand downloads of the initial podcast episodes, or they'll have sold some number of initial um, e-commerce product that they're developing. So they'll have some initial traction, or they won't. So with New York Times on Espanol, they actually gave that three years. So they actually gave it a lot of because they weren't sure. They had some traction, but not a lot, and they were seeing: is it going up, or is it is basically static? And so it was basically static and declining slightly, and so they just killed it. So I think in some cases you need a long runway of a couple of years. I think in general you need at least a year if it's a typical product cycle. Um, in some cases you get a positive result very quickly, right? There's some products that we've all seen that launch media, media new products, new columns that launch and it's immediately popular. But in other cases it takes a while for something to find its footing, right? People have to spread the word about it. They have to find out about it. They have to try it. So, so I think it varies. In terms of the issue of um, paid content versus not paid content, if you don't have something worth paying for, you can't expect people will pay for it. If you do have something that's worth paying for and that's unique, you have to be able to convince people that it is worth paying for, which sometimes means you know trial periods or test periods. It sometimes means better marketing. One of the things that I've seen around the world this past year is more effective marketing from news organizations about what they do. People around the world do not, many people, do not know what journalists actually do or why journalism has value. In, in the Washington Post, they had a whole campaign called Democracy Dies in Darkness. What will happen if we fail to cover, particularly in the US right now, if we fail to cover our corrupt leaders, what will they do next? And in the New York Times, there's a huge campaign basically showing people, here's what journalists do. They go and they get stories, they tell stories, they make a difference in society. Here's the differences we've made in all of these different issues. Here are the lives we've saved, right? This is why this matters. And people listen to that. That makes a difference. People respond to that. People want to be part of positive change in the world. 
They want to be part of something that's good. And if you make the case persuasively, if you market what we're doing effectively, people will respond to it. If you don't market what you do, or you assume that people know what you do, or why you do it, or how you do it, there might be a disconnect. And I think in journalism, we haven't always marketed ourselves effectively. And that, that, that has led to some misconceptions and misperceptions and lack of understanding of the cost of what we do. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, and my question is, um, in, in 2019 um, specifically, we saw very um, many platforms booming in Korea, new platforms, including Netflix. And my question is, what should um, producers or journalists consider when they're trying to launch their product to other countries? How, what kind of factors or ideas they should consider when they're trying to um, launch their product and tr when they're trying to localize their product in um, other countries? Um, I'm Yeom Seung Won from Han Academy, so um, and thank you very much. <laughs> Another interesting question, thank you. I, th I think, you know, sometimes people have areas of expertise that are unique. So if, if um, you know, if there's a particular sport or area of art or area of science that someone knows about that, that, that they can bring to another culture, another country, right, that can be really unique and powerful. So, you know, in Austria, there's, there's a tradition of great skiing, right, and great expertise around skiing. So if they're launching a product related to skiing, if an Austrian news organization is launching a product, an international product focused on skiing, whether it's a podcast, a newsletter, a micro site, whatever it is, um, a video series, uh, I think what they need to understand is how, you know, what are the kinds of questions and, and um, criteria, product criteria that people are using in, that, in whatever country they're targeting, right? So basically understanding local customers is, is the, the short, answer to it. And, and the more you know about what the local customers do and how they behave, the more likely you are to succeed. A lot of US companies, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, have come to various, whether it's Walmart going into various countries, various other US companies have tried to go abroad without having that local knowledge and expertise, and they've failed in many cases because they try to introduce the same product they have in the US and it doesn't work. Um, so I think local understanding is really helpful, and, um, and that's really crucial to, but, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of things that, um, areas of expertise that, that's, as I said earlier, span international boundaries. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for launching products in other countries. Hello, my name is Andre Olford. I'm from Russian news agency called Russia Sigodnia. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to ask my question and thank you for this event. Uh, my question is actually a little bit related to the previous one. I was um, wondering about uh, the trend that you've mentioned that uh, the translated, translation technology is developing, is developing very fast and maybe will be uh, in some years in a situation where we have a pu purely international media market when you can read, uh, choose from online media from any part of the world, uh, not only from your national media. Uh, and at the same time, you mentioned the failure of New York Times Espanol. Um, so I'm wondering, is, is it a part of this trend? And at the same time, we still have some media organizations that oper operate in multi-language environment, like uh, Huffington Post or BBC that also have Korean versions. So um, do you believe having uh, uh, your edition multi-languages is an advantage or disadvantage currently? And uh, do we have to uh, plan uh, our new media products uh, to be aimed for the global market uh, using only one language? Thank you so much. So I think in some areas, translation is not enough, right? So if I'm trying to cover Seoul, some things that are happening in Seoul, no matter what language I'm covering in, unless I know the city, unless I'm here reporting, I'm not going to be able to provide local coverage unless I'm on the ground doing reporting here, right? So in some areas, the issue, the challenge is not necessarily translation. But in other areas, um, and I'll give you a couple specific examples, if we're talking about climate coverage, climate issues that are affecting um, the world, 
you don't necessarily have to be in one country or another to read information that people are creating who are experts and have knowledge about that, nor do you have to speak their language to find value in that, as long as you can read it and understand it, right, as long as it's translated in some way. Same thing with uh, commodity coverage of, you know, let's say you're, you're interested in solar energy and changes in solar energy. An expert on solar energy and new technologies in solar energy might be in Germany, they might be in, in Lagos, Nigeria, they might be in Argentina, they might be in the US, they might be here in Seoul. It doesn't matter where they are, if they have expertise, it's a value to you. So you don't need to have necessarily a localized person giving you information. You want the best person, right? You want the person who has the most up-to-date, most accurate, most interesting to read, et cetera. And, and the country they come from doesn't determine whether their content or ideas are compelling. It shouldn't be the barrier for you to read that or to engage with it. And right now, there is a technical barrier because of the language, but I, I don't think there will be indefinitely. So um, I, I think that is going to be a big change. And I think, it, it, as I said, affects certain areas more than others. So science, you know, soccer, that's a global sport. If you, if you have a, a fan of a particular team, do you care where that person's writing from if they have the best authoritative voice about that soccer team or that league? It doesn't matter what country they're from. They have great writing, great coverage, great photographs, great video, whatever it is. Um, you want to be able to access any of that from all over the world, right? I mean, think about food products, right? Increasingly, we have food from all over the world, right? We don't want to be limited to food from one particular country. So uh, media should be the same in the long run. Hello. Thanks for your insights. Um, you gave us a lot of good examples of how and, more... And you are? Uh, I am Sumin Kim from a Korean startup, media, new media startup called Unique. Um, you gave us a lot of examples of how more uh, traditional uh, established media companies could utilize the like agile me mechanism or design thinking oriented approach. We're clearly coming from a little different uh, point of view. Uh, we have about our for for now our um, main and sole medium is news email newsletter, and we have about 100k uh, subscribers. And we were wondering what would be the important questions to ask for small startups like us so that we wouldn't fall into the swamp of that middle section you mentioned in the lecture. Um, yep, that would be my question. Um, I think that's great, first of all. Congratulations. That's, and that's not Thank easy. You. Reaching 100,000 newsletter Good subscribers luck. is not easy because there's so much information people have. Right? People don't wake up, and, and, and today, I'm sure if, we, if I were to ask this question, like how many of you woke up saying, I need more information, I don't have enough sources of information, I don't have enough email, right? I don't have enough social media, right? We all have a lot already, so it's hard to get people to subscribe to something new. So 100,000 is a good accomplishment, congratulations. So as far as issues to focus on, I think one question is to ask about your core, your hardcore users. It's always to know why do people who are really hardcore users, why do they like it? What is it providing to them? So that you know two things. One, what can you do more of? And what can you use to appeal to a broader range and find new people? Um, so understanding your users and why they use it and what they really, really value about it. And maybe what they don't like about it as much as well. And then understanding people who don't use it, why they don't use it, and what they use instead. And if you start to understand those things, you start to see opportunities for growth and reaching new people. As far as you know, long-term viability, I think one thing that people do often in startups is they aim too big. They think we need to be the next Facebook. We need to be the next cacao. We want to have a billion users, and we want to have you know, 10 million in recurring revenue by, you know, by our second year. I think that often growth is a dangerous temptation. There's a great recent book by Paul Jarvis called um, something like Company of One. And it's about how small businesses that remain small can still be successful and viable. It may mean you, you may not be a, you know, a billion dollar public company, but you don't need to be to have a successful, impactful business. And I think some businesses belong small. They can be impactful, they can do great work. You can have a nice life, have a nice salary, have a flexible work, et cetera, if you remain small. So I would say avoid the trap of trying to get big fast. A lot of people say, you need to grow fast. You need to get more money. You need to take Series A investment. I say in many cases, you don't need to do that. You need to figure out what could make the product better, incrementally improve the product for your customers and for your future customers, and let the other things fall into place. Don't take a lot of investment money. Don't try to grow super fast. Did that answer your question? 
뒤에 계신 남, 남성분. 예, 연합뉴스의 이충원 기자라고 하는데요. 그 아까 강의 중에 뉴스 프로젝트 포로 뉴 이어라 그래서 새로운 시대 이제 뉴스 프로젝트로 그 뉴스레터 팟캐스트와 함께 데이터를 얘기를 하셨는데 그 뉴스레터나 팟캐스트는 중간에 이제 설명을 많이 해주셔서 무슨 얘기인지 알겠는데 데이터가 새로운 어떤 뉴스 프로덕트가 된다는 게 어떤 의미인지 그 어디서 듣기로는 뉴욕 타임즈 같은 경우는 그 음식 면이 유명하다 보니까 그걸 레시피를 모아서 이제 푸드 NIT 푸드라는 사이트를 만들었고 거기에 오는 독자들이 그 다음에 어떤 행동을 하는지를 데이터 분석하다 보니까 뭐 식품 재료 회사를 인수하기 이르렀다 이런 식으로 내부 의사 결정에 도움이 된다는 의미에서. 뉴스 프로덕트가 된다는 의미인지 아니면 아크 CMS처럼 외부에다 그 자체를 어떻게 제공할 수 있다는 것인지 어떤 의미에서 그 데이터가 뉴스 프로덕트가 된다는 것인지 좀 설명해 주시기 바랍니다. So I think one thing that we can think about in terms of journalism is creating services and not just thinking of our product as sort of content, right? So if we think that we're providing services to customers, that opens up new things we can do. For example. Let's say the New York Times or Le Monde in Paris or The Guardian or any other international publication you want to think of wants to provide a new fitness sort of information service or business service. They can basically take the data you want to provide to them. Let's say I want to provide my, I have a, let's say I have an Apple Watch or a Samsung Watch and I have a data about my personal running and my health and my fitness and what I eat. And, I, and the news organization right, can provide me a customized recommended diet or recommended running plan or sports plan. so that I, um, I basically benefit from the knowledge and insight of the news organization, which gives me insight into how to prepare for a marathon, to run a marathon, for example. Or maybe they give me information that helps me manage my own portfolio, my business portfolio. Or to prepare for new tax law changes based on data I provide to them about my own finances. So they basically provide services that are customized to me, the customer, with data that they provide to me, to me or share with me. And I combine the data with the insight I have as the columnists, the analysis, the market knowledge, et cetera. So journalism organizations have a lot of insight and analysis and knowledge of different areas. And they can apply that in different ways. They can create individual articles right, for a general public, but they can also potentially provide individualized services. Um, and that could mean they provide customized recipes, it could mean they provide a running plan for you or a finance plan or anything else that's customized to you. Um, and that's something that people pay for. They already pay a lot of startups for those kinds of services. And there's no reason that they couldn't pay a news organization for a similar kind of service. Um, data can also be different things. It can also be providing data to businesses and companies like ProPublica. So there's a lot of data that news organizations have that um, businesses would actually benefit from having. Um, so those are a couple of a couple of examples in the data realm. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 MBN의 선한빛 기자라고 합니다. 아, 제가 종사하고 있는 곳은 이제 방송이라서 그 미국의 방송사에 대한 질문을 좀 드리고 싶은데요. 한국에서 보통 이제 대형 방송사들이 어, 새로운 미디어에 대응하는 방식이 유튜브나 아니면 페이스북에서 어, 읽기 또는 보기 좋게 콘텐츠를 올리거나 아니면 어, 기존에 했던 방송물을 그대로 유튜브나 페이스북에 올리거나 하는 수준에 그치고 있거든요. 대부분이요. 근데 미국의 방송사들도 뉴미디어에 대응하는 그 방식이 방금 제가 말씀드린 그런 한국의 방송사들의 대응 방식과 비슷한 모습을 보이는 수준인지 아니면 아까 강연 때도 이제 비즈니스 모델을 말씀하셨는데 사실 유튜브에 자사의 콘텐츠를 올리는 것만으로는 사실 그 광고료가 아, 들어오는 게 거의 없기 때문에 수익은 나지 않는 모델입니다. 현재까지 한국에서는요. 그런데 아, 미국에서는 그런 비즈니스 모델, 수익이 나는 방식으로 뉴미디어에 대응하는 아, 그런 고민들이 있는지 미국의 방송사들이 그리고 어, 혁신 사례가 있다면 아, 말씀을 해주시면 감사드리겠습니다. Yeah. So I would say the TV industry in the US, I'm going to make a generalization, but the TV news industry I think has been less innovative than the newspaper industry, for example, um, in the US. Um, and that's partly because the model is, um, in some cases, still working to some extent for local news providers, because people don't have an alternative for their local TV news. And that behavior is still a common behavior, even though it's starting to decline. It's not declining as much as newspaper consumption. 
So that hasn't, there hasn't been quite as much pressure on the TV industry, local TV news in particular, as there has been on the newspaper industry. Having said that, there is a common response, which is to use the social platforms like Facebook and, and YouTube in particular to upload content. So that's been one of the responses. Um, increasingly, there's collaboration across media forms, so the local newspaper will collaborate with the local TV station, the local TV station will collaborate with the local radio station to create a new podcast, for example, or a new newsletter. One thing that some uh, organizations have done is building more community, so having in-person events. This is a, th a trend across US media. I think people have recognized that we, s we all spend so much of our lives like this, with a screen in front of our faces, and not with a person that we're talking to. And people are human, they crave human contact, human dialogue. They wanna get out of their <laughs> screen and see actual people. And so a lot of organizations have created community events and they'll have journalists talk to other journalists or they'll have people talk about issues, et cetera. And, and the TV folks are very good at that in many cases because they're good presenters. And so that's been a, a, a kind of a thing to build a sense of community. Some news organizations are able to charge for events like that, but many at the local level are not using it as a monet monetization technique. They're using it as a community building technique. In some cases, there's some creativity around packaging deals for sponsors. So they will um, create digital packages online as well as on the TV, and then they'll mention them at, a, at an in-person event and things like that. There's a little bit of that going on but I think we've yet to see a lot of it. I think there's a lot that's still to come. The nature of TV in the US is gonna change significantly with the, the growth of the streaming platforms and OTT, et cetera. So I think that's another big area we'll see a lot of disruption in, but so far there has been a lot of stagnation. Yeah, 좋은 말씀 잘 들었습니다. 저는 그 중앙일보의 정재용 기자입니다. 그 교수님이 지금이 익사이팅 모먼트라고 하셨는데 사실 제 입장에서 동의하고 싶지만 저는 지금 한국 언론 상황은 디프레스트 모먼트라고 생각을 하고요. 지금 저희 한국 언론 시장을 보면 네이버라든지 이런 포털이 그 시장을 장악하고 있고 그 광고 수익의 상당 부분을 그쪽에서 가져가고 언론사들은 거기서 거의 얻는 게 없는 그런 구조로 돼 있습니다. 그런데 이제 그 디지털 시대가 도래하면서 한국 언론들도 디지털의 그 시대에 맞추기 위해서 여러 가지 그 시도를 하고 있습니다. 근데 이게 광고 수익은 줄어들고 구독자는 떨어지는 가운데 이게 수익이 지금 줄어드는 그 과정에서 그 디지털 시도들을 하고 있기 때문에 그 저희가 이제 예전에는 신문만 만들면 됐지만 지금 디지털도 같이 해야 되는 그 수익 구조가 더 이제 그 신문에 전념하기 어려운 그래서 신문의 그 품질이 좀 떨어지는 게 아니냐 이런 우려들이 나오고 있는 상황이거든요. 지금 그 뉴욕 타임스 예를 말씀드려 말씀하셨는데 뉴욕 타임스 같은 경우에는 그 영어 매체고 그리고 뭐 세계적인 매체이기 때문에 그그 그 들어온 레비뉴도 굉장히 많을 것 같고 그 거기서 일부를 이제 이렇게 그런 디지털에 투자해도 큰 부담이 없을 것 같지만. 저희 같은 경우에는 그거 그렇게 했을 때 실제로 이제 신문에도 그 타격이 있을 것 같거든요. 신문 제작에. 왜냐하면 인력이라든지 자원을 그, 그 디지털 쪽에 투자를 하면 당연히 그 신문에 로스가 있습니다. 그래서 이런 그 신, 한국 신문 시장이 굉장히 저희 제가 신문사에 있어서 그런데 하여튼 신문을 포함해서 언론, 언론사들이 굉장히 어려운 환경이어서 이게 정말 그저 앞에 저렇게 가면 우리는 이제 터널을 뚫고 아 밝은 내일을 맞이할 수 있다. 그러면 저희는 그렇게 뭐 하는 것도 오케이. 그렇지만은 지금 앞이 안 보이는 상황에서 아 이게 추, 추세니까 가야 된다. 그리고 그 신문 제작에 있어서 약간의 손실은 무릅써야 된다. 이렇게 한다면 그게 참 시, 신문사 기자로서는 굉장히 힘든 상황인데 교수님 같은 경우에 이거 이런 거에 대해서 어떻게 생각하십니까? Yeah. <웃음> So disruption is really hard, right? Look at any industry that's been disrupted, right? When the horse and buggy industry was disrupted, it was very hard to, for car companies to emerge from that. A lot of them failed. A lot of them failed to see it coming, and so they started preparing late. If you look at Scandinavian media companies, like Shipstead and Mit Media in Sweden, various others, they've been preparing for decades, and they've been working on 
being prepared for this moment, and they've done things to prepare for that, and that's served them really well. And they were very forward-looking, more, I would argue, than even the ones in the US. So I, I look to them for inspiration, and there are um, a lot of different challenges that are being faced simultaneously, right? There's um, the, the declining advertising is being faced while consumer behavior is changing, while the platform behavior is changing, right? While, in some cases, legal structures are changing with conglomeration and, and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of difficult challenges, and, and, and uh, even though it's a very exciting period, it's also a very painful period. So I think those, in my view, is that those two things can coexist, right? This can be a very painful, frustrating period of disruption and job layoffs and, and harder work for journalists while also being an incredible moment of opportunity, right? An exciting opportunity both for small startups like the ones we've heard from, the newsletters, the podcasts, as well as for big companies that are willing to be uh, adventuresome and to take some new risks. So I think both those things coexist. As far as the issue of, um, you know, the, the, the platforms, I think, you know, the nature is, the nature of technologies advances whether we like it or not. So, you know, a lot of media organizations have railed against Google and, and sort of argued for regulations and, and, and um, you know, I understand the motivation behind that, but I think it can be a distraction from what the core responsibility they have, which is to innovate and create new products and services that can't be stolen by the platform, right? If you create something that's really valuable and new and useful for your readers, your users, um, then you, know, you don't have to worry as much about what's happening in terms of advertising revenue. I don't think advertising revenue is what we should focus on in the long run. I think advertising revenue is going to continue to decline because the supply just expands exponentially, right? So I think we need to focus on getting people to pay for actual content or finding other revenue streams like um, membership programs, like e-commerce, like affiliate um, revenue in some cases, um, and, and variety of other things, right? Um, premium products, et cetera. So I think that's what we should be focused on, is that kind of new innovation, new kinds of products. And, and collaborations, you know, where we can find partners to work with um, to lower costs, to reduce costs, and to find new audiences. I think those are areas of, of exploration as well. Yeah, I want to say that I'm going 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 to say 뉴스 프로덕트 프로덕트 매니저라는 새로운 직책을 만들면서 어떤 변화를 시도한 배경이 무엇이었는지 그 부분에 대해서 왜냐하면 어떤 성, 과거의 성공은 새로운 이노베이 혁신으로 나가는 데 있어서 가장 큰 장애가 되곤 하는데 가장 큰 성공의 경험을 가지고 있는 회사가 그런 새로운 시도를 했던 배경이 무엇이었는지 그걸 좀 듣고 싶습니다. 감사합니다. Yeah, I think it's a good insight. It's a really good insight. And I like the way you put that, the past successes is an obstacle. They, they have $20,000 subscription fees. If you have a Bloomberg terminal, m m many of you may have used a Bloomberg terminal, it costs 20, 000, approximately $20,000 per year. And they have 325,000 subscribers, right? So it's a very profitable business, which is why Bloomberg himself is now able to, he's a $50 billion um, entrepreneur who's able to now fund his own presidential campaign which is a separate subject. Um, but, uh, but your point is, is a good one. And I think what's interesting about Bloomberg is they recognized that they were vulnerable for disruption themselves. So if you sell a product that's $20,000 a year, you can imagine how many other competitors want to charge a little bit less and create a new competitive product, right? So they were vulnerable to a lot of financial news startups and they recognize that they have to continually innovate, right? Um, Jeff Bezos says this very well, right? He says about Amazon, we're always in alpha mode. We're continually operating like a startup, even though they're a giant, huge mega corporation at this point, right? And, they, and it's not just words, right? And the evidence of that is constant, constant product releases, constant new product experimentations, right? Including a, a microwave that has Alexa in it, right? Which some stra you know, strange ideas, and some of them that fail miserably, right? They try to phone that was a miserable failure called a fire phone. But the point is that they realize they have to constantly, constantly change and disrupt themselves. And I think a lot of news organizations, if we, if we were really honest about this and look back through media history, we'll see that a lot of news organizations in, in the later part of the 20th century, 
big news organizations in particular, had big profit margins and didn't invest in R&D enough and sort of basically were a little bit um, lazy and didn't innovate enough, you know, to put it bluntly. And, and I think now we're paying the price for some of that because the, because the industry has changed so quickly and we weren't really ready for it. But now, fortunately, the, the good part of the story is that now people have woken up. So now no one's, no one's confused about what's happening, right? Everyone knows what's happening. They're not all sure what, what to do next, but no one is sleeping now. Everyone's awake, everyone's trying to fight to figure out what to do next. And they're hiring people like Aaron and many others to create these new products. And like many of the people in this room, they'll be the ones creating that innovation and creating new products. And, and those business models will emerge. We have to remember that we're still at the very beginning of this era. This is still very new. So we have a long, long way to go. This is a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. So there's going to be a lot of challenges and, and confusion and disruption in the beginning. But we will figure our way through it. It's a constant alpha mode. 멈추면 후퇴하는 것이다. 이런 말씀인 것 같습니다. 네, 지금까지 저널리즘 혁신, 또 혁신 저널리즘 이야기를 에, 해봤습니다. 너는 너무 좋은 말씀을 많이 들었고요. 어, 좀 감사드립니다. 그 저널리즘, 혁신 저널리즘은 이렇게 하루 아침에 되는 것이 아니라 제가 배운 것이 있다면 뭐 상상력과 또 문제를 해결하려는 의지와 또, 또 끊임없는 도전, 시행착오 이 끝에 incrementally, gradually 나중에 단계적으로 주어지는 것이다 이렇게 말씀을 하신 게 제가 기억에 남습니다. 그래서 그리고 혁신은 사람들 사이에 대화와 토론을 통해서 나온다. 어디서? 지금 답이 없어요. <웃음> 어디요? 술집이요. 아니면 카페든지. 그래서 혁신을 하시고 싶은 분은 당장 친한 분들과 지금 가까운 맥주 가게라도 가셔서 말씀을 나누시면 좋을 것 같습니다. I think we're about to uh, conclude here. And would you say a last word to our audience for excellent questions? It's great questions actually, right? Yeah. One thing I'd say is I have an open door. So any of you who visit New York, you want to visit the City University, you should feel free to come by. I mean that. You can visit the classes. You can say hello, and, and I'd love to chat. And uh, if you're not coming to New York, you can send me an email, jeremy at jeremykaplan.com. It was on the screen. And I answer every email that I get. So I'm happy to hear from you. If you have questions or you want to share something that you've done that's interesting, I'd love to learn from you as well. So I'd love to stay in touch and learn more about what you're doing and hear from you if you're interested in being in touch. Um, and, uh, and thank you again for, for spending the time and, and sharing your attention and, and being here tonight. And thank you again to the, to the Samsung Press Foundation for hosting this event. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, <laughs> thank you very for much. sharing this, this with me.